Number one, good morning, everyone, uh, and afternoon to all of you. Uh, we are grateful that you're able to join us today for our Institutional Insights webinar. Uh, for those of you whom I've uh, not yet met, my name is Felix Lin, and I head up Beacon Point's Institutional Consulting Services Group. Uh, before we get started, uh, first and foremost, um, on behalf of Beacon Point, and I know uh, Chris and CCS, uh, we hope that everyone's staying safe in this season. We know that it hasn't been easy for many of us, and just uh, hope that you and your loved ones are uh, healthy uh, and remain healthy. Um, and if you followed us on our Institutional Insights webinars that we continue to hold on a quarterly basis, where our Chief Investment Officer, Michael Dow, always provides a thorough presentation on, on how we think investors can navigate today's markets, we are uh, excited to have uh, today's webinar uh, to really discuss some of today's perspectives on philanthropy. Uh, Beacon Point serves as the investment consultant for a number of not-for-profit organizations. And while we provide you know, assistance to our clients from an investment and corporate governance point of view, we understand and support the uh, importance of fundraising, especially given you know, today's fundraising environment and the challenges that it may uh, present. So I'm excited to welcome Chris Looney from uh, CCS to the webinar to provide a better understanding of philanthropy today. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items just uh, during the webinar. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me at flin at beaconpoint.com. Uh, Robin, I think, is going to try to stick that somewhere in the chat uh, where my email address is. Again, uh, if you can send uh, any questions throughout the, the presentation you may have, I'll try to ask them if we can fit them in. Uh, and if not, we'll be sure to get back to you uh, shortly thereafter with a response or, again, uh, it'll either be someone from our team here or Chris and CCS will uh, definitely get back to you shortly uh, to provide any responses uh, and any guidance as possible. Um, and uh, thank you again for uh, joining us. Please note that uh, this uh, webinar is being uh, recorded. And again, after it goes through uh, appropriate compliance channels here at Beacon Point, as well as CCS, uh, we'll be able to send a copy of this out to you and your colleagues or any other organizations you think that this will be helpful for. Uh, we think that it'll be a great resource. Um, and um, lastly, uh, we'll be sharing, uh, Chris will be sharing really uh, some, um, I think some analysis, some uh, thoughts from the Giving USA report. So uh, if you're registered for this, we'll be sure to send you a copy of the Giving USA report, um, as well as provide a link to it um, to send that around to, again, any other colleagues. Um, thanks again for joining us. Uh, we think uh, and know that this will be helpful for you guys. And uh, without any further ado, Chris, I will uh, hand it over to you. Thanks again for joining us. Awesome. Well, thanks, Felix. And uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon to, to those east uh, of me at this moment, at least. Um, it's so good to be with you. And I want to thank Beacon Point Advisors for the invitation to make this presentation um, interestingly, Beacon Point has been a, a firm that I've referred to my clients for endowment uh, management for more than two decades now. I've shared that with Felix, and it's fun to be in a partnership uh, with them today on this presentation. Um, I'm glad you joined us. Uh, this is uh, such a great opportunity to share some of the highlights from the recently published Giving USA 2021 report. This is a report that is researched and prepared by the Lilly School of Philanthropy at Indiana University. And it's produced every year by the Giving Institute. It's actually the longest running report on philanthropy in America. Um, and um, the Giving Institute is an association of consultants and other supportive companies in the nonprofit field, specifically focused on the philanthropic sector. CCS, my firm, is a member, uh, and I'm a proud board member of the Institute as well. Um, so, you know, if you can remember back to this time last year in 2020, many of us are trying to forget it, uh, you might recall how cloudy the outlook was for us in the charitable sector at that time. And let's be honest, it was a time of doubt and concern for all of us in terms of the future outlook. Um, but whether in the macro business sense uh, or not, certainly for us in the fundraising world, it was a time of, um, uh, of real concern. We uh, just didn't know how things were going to shake out for giving in 2020, and everyone had a guess 
I, I think at certain times I thought it was going to be a dismal year in terms of giving toward philanthropy. Um, given the low visibility and a lot of cautionary signs, we can totally understand that. Um, and while we're still struggling a bit today to find our footing in many areas, I'm certainly more confident today than I've been uh, and very excited for the opportunities that I see out ahead for, for us all. And I hope the same is true for all of you, regardless of your um, positions, perspectives, organizations, and, and whatnot. Um, certainly, we, uh, we have to be somewhat optimistic to be in the fundraising field. Those of us that are fundraisers are eternal optimists. So we're always looking for the good. Um, and, um, uh, and I'm certainly finding a lot of good things to celebrate and uh, excited to share some of those good things with you uh, in, the, in the coming minutes. Um, but real quickly, let me just say a few brief words of introduction about myself. Uh, as Felix mentioned, my name is Chris Looney. I'm one of several principals of uh, CCS Fundraising. Um, and I've been blessed for the last 23 years to lead a team in Southern California that works with extraordinary individuals to make philanthropy elevated for our clients, our client partners, the community. Uh, and what we say often is that we get the chance to work with extraordinary individuals to champion inspirational causes. And that's really what drives our work every day. Um, next year, CCS will be celebrating 75 years, and we are the largest and most accomplished, we think, fundraising consulting firm in the, in the world, and um, we focus exclusively on partnerships with nonprofits in the fundraising arena, and so being a expert and thought leader in philanthropy is really important to us, and that's one of the reasons why we care so deeply about our relationship with Giving Institute, the Giving USA report, and want to bring this message about uh, what's going on in philanthropy to the broadest possible audience. Um, so let me get right at it and share with you what I consider to be some of the extraordinarily good news from last year's philanthropy. And I'm pleased to report that Giving USA estimates that charitable giving in the United States reached $471.44 billion in 2020, uh, its highest level ever. And this represents a 5.1% increase from 2019 in real dollar terms. On average, individuals, foundations, and corporations gave a combined $1.29 billion per day uh, to, to charitable institutions, to the nonprofit world, just extraordinary. And there were so many factors that resulted in this new high water mark in giving. Uh, we would have to go back 100 years to find similar conditions. The circumstances of 2020 created a new uh, unique combination for us that elevated philanthropy which included, obviously and strangely enough, COVID-19, the pandemic, which led to significant calls for generosity and support. You all are familiar with the emergency appeals that went out uh, um, by every organization uh, frequently and, and repetitively throughout the year. Um, there were obvious racial and social justice movements that generated a surge in giving to organizations working on racial equity and social justice issues. The stock market helped. Uh, growth in the S&P of 16.3% uh, was uh, a positive benefit, uh, as it always is, to philanthropy. Um, even in the face of other economic challenges, when the stock market's up, giving tends to, to follow. Um, and uh, in a government effort to offer relief to the pandemic, the CARES Act really did help many households and organizations, not only weather the storm, but also contemplate giving uh, or continuing their giving or even giving new gifts to organizations that they care deeply about. Um, in this graph, you can see the breakdown of giving by source. 
Individual giving, for those of you not familiar with how philanthropy works in America, uh, continues to be the largest source of charitable contributions. It's at $324 billion and some change, about 69% of total giving. Um, the amount of money given by individuals is growing each year, but we're seeing the number of individual donors shrinking. And this is a key takeaway for all of you here to remember. Giving in total dollar terms continues to grow at a pretty fast rate, but the number of donors is decreasing, meaning a smaller number of donors is making much larger gifts um, and more than making up for the difference, but we're still finding fewer and fewer donors giving on an annual basis, which is concerning. Hey, but, Chris, uh, I had a question here and sorry, uh, trying to figure out when I can jump in with some of these questions. Jump in um, anytime. Uh, how do you, uh, question is, how do donor advised funds, you know, and, and family foundations, they don't fit, you know, nicely in any of these buckets here, but uh, how do uh, they factor into these trends? Yeah, well, they are accelerating, accelerating dramatically, more so on the DAF, the donor advised funds and community foundation giving, not necessarily the sort of private family foundations. Those are relatively steady and growing, but the acceleration we're seeing is um, through DAFs and, and community foundation giving. It's just off the charts in terms of the growth. And, and it, it's one of the points I wanted to make here where, as we think about individual giving. You might see that $324 billion number from individuals and, and say, oh, wow, well, I would have expected more. You should. It, actually, about 90% of all giving comes from individuals. The joke that I often make uh, in these sessions is that dead people give away more money in the United States than companies. Okay. Dead people give away more money than companies every year. Um, so, so the bequest number you see here is giving from individuals. And of the foundation amount here, which is pretty uh, significant, half of that represents giving from individuals in the form of donor advised funds, um, community foundation giving, and also pri private family foundations. So only half of that are those institutional foundations like Weingart, um, Parsons, depending on where you are, there are a number of community foundations that you would be familiar with that are more institutional, the Gates Foundation, let's say. So, so um, the good news is that giving is finding a way to grow um, and, and might perhaps be one of those reasons for a decrease in individual, the, the individual donor count, because more and more people are finding alternative mechanisms like DAFs to give through. Um, but whatever the case, um, we are um, fully aware that individuals drive philanthropy. And on a smaller scale, uh, corporate giving and foundation giving do uh, make a, a big difference as well. Um, and there were some, some changes as well uh, that I wanted to make everybody aware of. So, um, foundation giving, inclusive of grants made by independent operating and community foundations and DAFs, um, as I mentioned, Felix, has been growing. Um, foundations made up, just as an example, 6% of all giving in 1980, okay? By 2010, it was 14%, and now it's 19% of all giving, okay? So it's, it's growing, and, and largely because of the DAF uh, arena, right? Corporate giving, which is about 4% of all giving, um, totaled about $17 billion and includes cash and in-kind gifts made through corporate giving programs, as well as grants and gifts made by corporate foundations. But it's just not as significant as you might imagine. And as we look at the year-over-year -year changes, there was an increase in individual bequest and foundation giving, not surprising, and a decrease in corporate giving last year, also not surprising, given the fact that there was um, a pretty significant decline in corporate uh, pre-tax profits of about 3.5% and a GDP decline of about 2.3%. So um, as the economy goes, 
so too does corporate giving. And that's just an important factor to keep in mind. Uh, and one of the things that is most challenging about fundraising for those organizations that uh, continue to rely on corporate giving uh, as the main source of their revenue, they're at the mercy of the economy, less so with individuals and foundations. As we turn our attention to total giving by sector, um, giving grew in eight out of the 10 sectors that are here represented. Religion continues to receive the most giving in America, about $131 billion. Um, next was education, then human services. And despite being categories with a, a lower share of total charitable dollars, the fastest growing sectors um, were uh, giving to individuals, which is the DAFs and the community foundations. They don't have a home specifically in a sector. So we've had to create this uh, new, relatively new sector called giving to individuals, that's DAFs right? And the environment and animals with um, about an 11.6 percent increase. Um, so in terms of the year-over-year -year changes by recipient, um, we were surprised that there were uh, declines. We figured with uh, the way things were shaping out and the big numbers that were reported that uh, everything would have been lifted, you know, a rising tide lifting all boats. Not the case. Uh, the art sector suffered. I think everyone was kind of anticipating this, though, as the shutdowns impacted in-person events, uh, most dramatically at arts institutions and, and museums and performing arts centers. It's not surprising that giving was down in that sector about 7.5%, right? That, that's not uh, so surprising. But I was surprised personally to see the decline in healthcare giving in 2020, especially given the enormous focus on global health issues last year, right? Like that intuitively doesn't make sense uh, that giving would be down when you're experiencing a global pandemic. And anecdotally from clients and friends in the sector uh, here in Southern California, where I'm based, um, most hospitals that, that I work with, that I talk to, put up record years in fundraising. So this experience, locally at least, doesn't really connect to me as it might have in a, in a national perspective. Yeah, and, and I know that um, one of the things is, you know, how to make sense of that. I mean, Felix, you're probably asking yourself, like, why? Why would giving in, in healthcare um, be down in, in such a year. Um, and I think the, the reality that uh, I've discovered is that um, with the pandemic, with the social distancing, uh, with the new protocols, the actual investments in healthcare, the uh, procedures that were performed, uh, but largely just the economics of healthcare were down about 20% year over year. And I think, and again, I don't have uh, the right answer necessarily, but I think that decline in revenue, similarly to the arts, performing arts sector or, or arts sector in general, uh, led to a decline in patient giving and general uh, giving to, to hospitals as perhaps they weren't necessarily um, uh, having that heart, life-saving heart surgery or receiving uh, the same care that they might in other years and thinking to themselves, wow, I should really do something for the hospital that just saved my life. That's my interpretation. I don't know, Felix, if you, if you have a different interpretation of that. No, there's a question that I did wanna do, uh, and I think that's always difficult to understand. And, and you know, uh, we, we are always in the business of trying to uh, figure out what's going to happen in the future in, in, in the investment world, right? Because looking backwards doesn't help, uh, but trying to uh, be in front of any moves in the market. Uh, and the question that uh, came up just now was, uh, in terms of changes year by year, are they significant changes year by year? Or are, there, are they slow, you know, moves one way or another, or just does it depend on, I think it was the environment of what's happening uh, in the world that things will move one way or another. 
That's great. I mean, such a, a good question, the right perspective. Um, the movements between individual giving and foundations, corporations, th those seem to be glacial moves, very modest uh, ticks up or down on an annual basis in terms of the overall percentages. But um, in terms of the giving to different sectors, there are wild swings. Um, and, and really, in some ways, given the 80-20 rule of certain things, 90-10 rule of certain things, you can imagine that if a billionaire all of a sudden decided in one year to give their entire state, estate to, let's say, education, then that is going to have, uh, you know, and if $20 billion suddenly moves into education that wasn't there the year before, that can make a dramatic impact in, in that particular sector. So we see pretty wild gyrations from year to year in, in years where there are enormous uh, natural catastrophes. You know, the year with uh, the, the tsunamis uh, in, in Asia, um, I can remember vividly the outpouring of support and that dramatically influenced giving to that particular sector. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, the speaking of extraordinary uh, events, uh, the, the philanthropic response to COVID-19 was monumental. Um, and it reflected the sort of global impact of, of COVID and, um, and people's response uh, in, in terms of generosity was super uh, prevalent and strong. But interestingly, it didn't manifest itself in a single category, but broadly across the philanthropic spe spectrum as every nonprofit was seen as negatively impacted by the events of the, the pandemic. Um, so it was much more uh, universal in terms of uh, the, the sort of support that it provided to the nonprofit sector. Um, as of July 2021, Candid, a major tracking organization in the nonprofit giving space, recorded that more than $24 billion was granted and pledged in support of COVID-19 relief work uh, worldwide specifically. That's a pretty big number. And over $22 billion of that total, so almost all of it, was designated for organizations based here in the United States, which kind of makes the point that the vast majority of philanthropy uh, is local. Giving is local. Um, and uh, in 2020, we also saw American donors using philanthropy as a tool to advocate for some of the long overdue changes in society amid both the pandemic, but also the inequities um, and the widespread movement for racial justice. So that was a, a major trend that we experienced as well uh, last year. Um, and you know what I celebrate is the fact that philanthropy gives Americans a unique opportunity to mm, create change. We know that money facilitates um, change and uh, and philanthropy certainly drove a lot of that uh, in our communities. Uh, just a couple more slides. Um, this particular graph, which sh shows giving as uh, in relationship to GDP, gross domestic product, um, as you can see, reflects that there have been modest changes up and down in terms of giving as in relation to gross domestic product. It's been around 2% since 1980 and is high uh, this past year relative to GDP, probably because stock market was up, giving was up, GDP was down. So we see the relationship there. Um, but you know, I, I, I struggle with what it'll look like in 2021, the fact that GDP recovers, um, stock market's still high. So I expect that it'll still be in the 2% range, but um, it'll probably not be as high as 2.3 is my guess. But I, I want philanthropy to become 2.5 or 3% of GDP. I want, I want philanthropy to be a growth industry, right? And, um, and that's not likely to happen unless some significant things change. 
Um, and we'll, we'll probably talk about a couple of those things that do need to change in a minute. But um, during 2020, uh, affluent households, just so you know, 90% of them, of high net worth individuals and households gave to charity. So that's very encouraging. Um, and about 85 to 93%, based on some surveys, maintained or increased their level of support for nonprofits last year. Um, about one third, 37% of affluent individuals increased their giving to organizations that had a focus on health, medicine, or helping people in need of food, shelter, and other necessities. So some interesting things, uh, certainly, to, to take away. Um, and as a, a percentage of disposable personal income, uh, giving continued to hover around that 2% mark. Um, and this uh, has been very similar since we've been tracking uh, those kinds of statistics over the last 30 years plus. Um, one of the things that I wanted to be sure to... Hey, Chris, there, there was a, a question yeah. that came up, uh, sorry, is uh, regarding disposable income and in, in hovering about 2%, I believe that it was saying. Uh, question is, um, how are you talking uh, with, you know, not-for-profits about the impact of taxes and do you see that having any significant impact on giving? Amazing. Great question. Such a good question. Um, especially relevant now as we um, enter into the last several months of a year where um, there are incentives to uh, perhaps better incentives to make gifts to charity than might exist next year. We are counseling our nonprofit clients to be very uh, assertive and forward in their conversations with prospective donors about making large gifts this year um, to take advantage of certain uh, tax opportunities that might not exist next year with the uh, expected changes in, uh, in, in the tax plan. So um, we're uh, certainly spending a lot of time trying to get our clients in front of their best donors and in front of other donors to say, hey, just in anticipation of what might come next year, um, might it be a, a good time to start thinking about making um, that big gift now? And, uh, and it's working. We're finding that there is a audience that's very receptive to those conversations. They might choose to, to wait and make that gift, but for, for fundraisers like me, we're always looking for a good opportunity to have a productive conversation with a, a donor or a prospective donor. And so I would use the next five months uh, as that good opportunity to have that conversation. Yeah. Great point. Thank you. Such a, such a good question. And, and speaks to some of the trends that um, you know, we saw last year, but we also see continued. And one of those is um, giving appreciated securities uh, of course, uh, to not uh, uh, be uh, sort of uh, hurt by the tax man uh, as a result of, of, of those gains. But anyway, 2020 was certainly a year of unprecedented fundraising trends. Um, who would have thought a year ago that uh, you could actually have a, a virtual gala um, and still raise as much money as you did the year before when that event was in person. So what we've seen is the emergence of virtual activities connected to fundraising when previously everyone assumed that those things had to be done in person. So the, the virtual cultivation event, the Zoom con connect, you know, these did not limit fundraising's capacity to excite and encourage people uh, to give. And I think that we'll probably uh, take forward that um, opportunity to engage people virtually uh, in a very productive way going forward. So what a great thing to learn coming out of this uh, 2020 pandemic year. Um, we also uh, know that technology played a huge factor in uh, the growth of giving. Online giving reached its highest level in history last year. In 2020, online giving, gifts made online reached 
13% of all charitable giving in the United States. That's enormous relative to previous years and is only going to continue to give, to, to, to grow. Um, you know, we're seeing now the emergence of um, uh, Bitcoin and, and other uh, more interesting giving methods uh, and tools as well coming on the scene. Many of our clients are accommodating those types of, of gifts. So that's a unique uh, a trend. But um, I think going back to the online giving, uh, what we're looking at is over a 20% increase year over year in online giving. And that trend doesn't seem to be slowing in the slightest. So being uh, prepared to take advantage of these trends is incredibly important. And, and you wouldn't necessarily, you might intuitively know it, but it, it's confirmed in this data that we're able to, to access. And, and Chris, and, and, and just for the, the, the uh, audience here, you know, we, uh, we expect to uh, have a series uh, for the remainder of the year just on fundraising. And uh, this is really just setting the, the playing field where we wanted to provide just a, a quick a summary uh, of, uh, you know, some trends and what uh, Chris and his team are, are seeing in fundraising. Uh, again, so we'll be rolling up the sleeves and going, getting in deeper throughout the remainder of the year. Uh, but uh, a question is, you know, given these trends, um, Chris, uh, what should uh, not-for-profits, again, uh, the participants here are not-for-profit organizations, what should they be thinking about in terms of capital campaigns uh, moving forward or, or major, you know, fundraising efforts? How does that fit in? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've never seen the market, the fundraising market, stronger uh, especially in terms of major gift support, transformational gifts, you know, and it, it's hard to pick the amount that you're talking about, but, you know, gifts that are five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, 50000 100000 a million, $10 million, those larger gifts um, are uh, being given away at record rates. And so it's hard for me to counsel any client against pursuing their vision uh, robustly at this point in time, start thinking about a capital campaign, planning for a capital campaign, embarking on a capital campaign, whether it's focused on buildings, endowment, program growth, whatever it might be, um, it seems to be uh, the, the best time I can possibly imagine to, to be engaging in those types of activities. Um, I, I know there will come times where the, the market is not as strong, where giving is not as robust, um, but while it is, you know, I, I think it makes sense to get out and really pursue those activities. And even if it's not a, with a campaign banner attached to it, uh, the effort towards securing major gifts from those individuals that are closest to you who probably have more capacity now than they've ever had um, is, is totally appropriate and necessary. Um, and, and, you know, fundraising, as I mentioned earlier, requires a lot of effort and a lot of focus and attention. And one of the trends that I'm most concerned about that I wanted to speak to as my last slide um, is the, the fact that there are um, a shrinking number of donors in the ecosystem in, in America. And it's not because population growth is shrinking. Uh, fewer people are actually giving. And, um, and, and the challenge has not been felt yet because giving has continued to increase because the smaller number of donors are making significantly larger gifts on average over the course of the year, more than making up for that, uh, that difference. And my concern, of course, is that um, philanthropy can only survive and thrive in the way that we want it to if a higher percentage of Americans choose to participate. Um, so when we see statistics, for example, that suggest that 20% um, of all households in the United States provide 80% of all charitable giving, and that 1% of households provide 
45% of giving, you know, that raises some concerns in the fact that giving really isn't as democratic as we'd like it to be in the United States. Um, and we need to make sure that we are doing everything that we can uh, to encourage uh, all individuals of all generations to, um, to support our charitable work. And, um, and I, I don't think it's hard necessarily, it just requires intention. And, and Chris, this isn't a this isn't yeah. a question from from the audience, but uh, you know, and again, why why do you think again from your experience, why do you see this trend? Why is it why is it happening? Right? Uh, and do you see it continuing? You know, this um, and what will it take for the trend to go the other way? Yeah, I mean, it's it's. It's not an easy question to answer. It's not an easy problem to solve. I think generally speaking, there is a trend toward, um, is this bad to say, greater selfishness, uh, a, a lack of understanding of, of a responsibility that every person in this country has to, to help those that are in need. And I think there were generations, going back hundreds of years, where it was easier to convince people that they had a responsibility to help others. And um, we've maybe lost our ability to educate generation over generation about that responsibility. And it's not possible to blame someone or blame. I think it's just society, the shifting focus of society that's leading to this. And, um, you know, like uh, climate change, you know, if, if you're not paying attention to it, you, you know, you're going to lose the battle, right? So it's just a matter of being focused, recognizing the problem, addressing it where you can. I think those of us that are in the nonprofit field should always be encouraging people whenever we can to support their local charities. It's good for our, um, uh, our spirit, <laughs> you know, it makes us healthier people to help other people. Uh, and for, you know, and, and we are just so blessed, all of us, to be able to, to help other people. So um, I, I want to, as part of my mission in life, to, to continue to uh, uh, find opportunities to generate those incredibly large transformational gifts but I also want to continue to elevate philanthropy nationally where um, everybody feels excited to do something, right? And, and in those two ways, I think we have the greatest opportunity to change the world and improve the world. And, and so I'll get off my soapbox now, but, but that's the two levers that I wanna push for in giving big, big gifts. And hey, let's make sure everyone is participating, right? Thank you. Um, so I, there, there is a resource that I would encourage all of you to, to jump into. It's our 10th anniversary publication of uh, the philanthropic landscape uh, and is uh, an aggregation of statistics and findings and research that we do throughout the year. It's fun, it's a good read. One of my favorite things is to see um, who's making the biggest gifts in the US year over year, and uh, not surprising to many of you, it will be Mackenzie Scott, who has single-handedly given more in one year than the Gates Foundation and the Ford Foundation combined. But jump into it, it's a great resource. Um, and with that, Felix, what's left? No, I, and thank you everyone. And, and I assume for those uh, of you that are more technically uh, sophisticated than I am that I, I think what I was told is you could have taken a, a screenshot or, you know, zoom your camera on that key, QR code. Uh, it's up there again, uh, and you should get access uh, or you can go to that website. Uh, but uh, thank you, Chris, uh, for your insights, your perspective. And I think this is very helpful. Um, and for everyone attending, uh, I, I hope that you saw it in Chris's presentation. This is near and dear to his heart. Uh, and as well as Beacon Points, again, the, the, we specialize in working with not-for-profits, as does Chris, 
Uh, and so we hope that this was uh, helpful to you, a resource to you. And again, we will uh, be sending out for those that registered a copy of the Giving USA uh, report or, or a link to it, as well as uh, if you like uh, a copy of this presentation and uh, feel free, you have Chris's email address there below. Feel free to email him directly. Again, uh, we find this to be, you know, an important time just to surround our clients, right? Uh, we've got the investment side, but we, what we want to do is we want to make sure we're surrounding our clients with uh, good partners that can help them really be good stewards and to raise additional funds to help them achieve their mission. So feel free to reach out to Chris and his team, or you have my email address and, and many of you know us, and uh, we'll be uh, following up uh, with uh, future webinars on uh, fundraising and uh, different types of uh, tactics and uh, best practices. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Uh, be safe, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of the summer. Thanks, Felix. Thanks, everyone.